the largest and most impactful law enforcement event of the year, the International Association of Chiefs of Police Annual Conference and Exposition, is proud to call the Lone Star State its home this year. As public safety professionals descend on Dallas, Texas, they'll learn new techniques, advance their knowledge and careers, and equip their departments for ongoing success. This is my first conference, so I'm hoping to just get a lot of experience out of it and take that back to my home agency and learn from what others are doing across the world. When I was a brand new chief, it really gave me an opportunity to learn from others. I would encourage everyone to get involved, go to the sessions, and learn from those that have already been there. You have a, a plethora of different topics, um, lots of different offerings, and so I think it sets us up to have things that are relevant to our size, uh, our constituents, and our police departments. Learning from chiefs from all over the world is what we come here for. We all learn from each other, and that's how we get set up for success. For the next four days, you'll hear from experts, keynote speakers, and fellow law enforcement colleagues. And this is the only place to find it all. This is IACP TV. Welcome to Texas and the 2022 IACP Annual Conference. Let me tell you, it's great to be back. This is a source for excellence. I'm Stephen Horn, and I'll be taking you through the next few days of important ceremonies, sit down interviews, and special sessions. There's a lot happening here at the Convention Center, so remember. You can always find the latest ICP TV episode right here on the TVs displayed throughout the Convention Center. On the homepage of the ICP meeting website, back in your hotel rooms on the in-house ICP TV channel, check us out on your shuttle bus ride to and from the Convention Center. And as always, you can find us on our YouTube channel or Twitter feed. After a three-year hiatus, we're finally back face-to-face -face for the International Association of Chiefs of Police kicking things off at this year's conferences. ICP Executive Director and CEO Vince Tellucci and Deputy Executive Director and COO Terry Cunningham. Well, first of all, thanks very much indeed for talking to us again today, and uh, it's great to be here. It's been too long, Stephen. It's great to see you again. Great to be in Dallas. It's great to be in Dallas. Um, we're thrilled. Dallas Police Department's been fantastic. Um, Every metric you can imagine for successful conferences there, whether it's registration or exhibits or sponsorships. And, and Dallas, as you can see behind me, has been as is beautiful and it's been fantastic to work with. And Terry, what are, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to in the conference this year? Well, I think that our members, you know, Stephen, to be honest with you, where they haven't been together since 2019, it's been three years, for them to be, be able to convene and get together and have these conversations face to face. As you know, Stephen, I mean, policing has faced some really difficult times in the last, you know, eight to 10 years from Ferguson, you know, through George Floyd, through the pandemic. So there's a lot to talk about. What do you want people to take away from the conference? As you, as you mentioned earlier, Stephen, you know, policing policing has changed a lot. What we've seen in the last you know, number of years, last probably four or five years, is kind of that shift towards what does transparency really look like, right? We've talked about it, but what is it? Is it just the, you know, kind of the ubiquitous use of body-worn cameras? Is it meeting with the communities? And I think you're going to see a lot of conversations around that at this conference. I, I think they'll also get perspective. Understanding that perspective that you play an important role, not only in your respective community, but on the global policing stage for sharing those much needed best practices. And there's no place quite like the ISP conference to be able to convene and, and, and share and learn and take those lessons back to your respective communities. Well, thank you both very much indeed for uh, taking time to talk to us today. I hope you have a great conference. I know you will. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Stephen. Good to great see you, Stephen. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. So we start off our tour across the country, highlighting those departments at the forefront of law enforcement. The residents of Cobb County wanted change, and they certainly got it in newly elected Sheriff Craig Owens. Let's see how Sheriff Owens wasted no time overhauling the adult detention center, upgrading to cutting edge technology, and re-engaging with a vibrant community. You know, when I ran for office, I ran on three pillars, truth, trust and transparency. Unfortunately, our community have lost trust in our law enforcement and sheriff's office. So I had to rebuild that trust. For so many years, the Hispanic and Latino community have been neglected or being left behind. 
And now with Sheriff Kirk Owens, that was the beginning of a new era in our county. Uh, my second thing I really dove into, I knew we had to improve the conditions in our detention center. Camera upgrades, cell locking mechanism upgrades, roof repairs, showers, just things that, that we knew we had to do as a basic upgrade that was not done in the past, we had to get done now. I'm very excited to see what has happened and to be part of what is going to happen. We are en route to becoming one of the best law enforcement agencies in, in the country. Now to a department that seeks to partner with its community in every endeavor. Let's head right off to the Commonwealth of Virginia to see how the Roanoke Police Department does just that. Roanoke is a great place to live, work, and play. We have a city of, you know, nearly 100,000 citizens, which uh, increases because we are the region's hub of employment. Policing in Roanoke City is very unique. We have a great working relationship with our community. We're involved in all different aspects of talking with them, communicating, and getting involved in activities, being at our many festivals and um, community outreach events that happen here in Roanoke City. What makes us different from most other departments is our community connections and our community collaborations. The fact that we are citizen-centric, we really value and inculcate our community expectations into what we do on a daily basis. The Los Angeles Police Department is a diverse, complex and innovative organization. Whilst being a leading law enforcement agency in policy and programming, they also lead with the heart. Let's check out how the LAPD embody the motto to protect and to serve daily. The mission of the Los Angeles Police Department is to protect and serve people who live, work or, or come through here to protect lives and property of its residents uh, and to do so in a manner that has uh, the best uh, of constitutional policing. That's what's done with integrity, it's done with professionalism, and it's done with the compassion and care. We've really developed a holistic approach to making change in the community while building trust and relationships with the LAPD. This is a compassionate group of individuals who have the heart to go out and stick to it. We don't stop and get comfortable. And we are constantly seeking input externally to make ourselves better. With the expansion of programs like this in neighborhoods that need good quality service, that feel like they have not got it for decades, this is where policing is going. ICP President Chief Dwight Henninger has held numerous law enforcement positions over his decades in public service and now he's here with us to discuss how his time at the helm of ICP has been. Chief Henninger, welcome. Thank you ever so much indeed for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, so you're coming to the end of your year as uh, president. Always an exciting thing to have uh, done, but how's it been? It's a little bittersweet coming to an end for sure. It's been a great year being able to travel the world and see what great things people are doing in policing around the world. Now, the other thing is it's really exciting to be back here in Dallas, isn't it, in person, first time in three years. It's great to be anywhere in person right now for <laughs> sure. Yeah, the Hollywood Squares on Zoom meetings has just gotten really old. So what are some of the things that you're looking forward to this week? Uh, the interactions, being able to really see people in person and, and say hi in person and really build those relationships that have waned over the last couple of years. It's really great to be together again. And what do you think are some of the kind of key issues facing uh, policing as we move into, uh, what is it, 2023 next year? Well, you know, I always thought it was the issue of uh, police reform and policing was just a United States issue, but really that transformed the, the world. It, it went all over the issues around you know, race and things that we need to be able to talk about and deal with ourselves is really important. We need to take a good hard look at our, our policing philosophies in each of our organizations. Now you're in a position of, uh, of leadership. Well, what's your advice to somebody else who would like to follow the same path, would like to become a leader within the ICP? 
Well, there's a couple different pathways. One is to get involved in one of the committees. That's the path I took. I became the chair of the committee and then uh, joined the, the board of directors and uh, eventually ran for office. Another tract is through the state associations of chiefs of police or the international division, another great way to really kind of find out about the organization, meet the great people that are running um, IACP and, and really become involved. And from that, then you can make that decision whether you, you could take the time to run for office. And you leave IACP, my final question is, you leave IACP facing interesting times, but in really good health, don't you? Well, we're in good health financially. We have the most members we've ever had in our, our history. And uh, I think that the policing profession needs to support each other and learn from each other. And that's what we're really good about facilitating that information transfer. Well, thank you ever so much indeed, as I said, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. It's great being here. The Eau Claire Way. That's how the Eau Claire Police Department strengthens trust through community engagement and practice. Let's see that slogan put into action. I wanted to work for a department that takes care of its personnel, has a great community support, and provides opportunity for career advancement. And Eau Claire PD checked those boxes for me. Part of this Eau Claire way is the idea of public and private partnerships. Um, the other part is embedded in this idea of respectful relationships. And we've been building these relationships now for almost 20 years. We're community informed. It's necessary for us to provide police services in a way that's consistent with our community's expectations. Through this dialogue, we've developed four priorities. Our policing philosophy, how we train, our department policies, and transparency, being open with the public that we serve. These four pillars position us to provide the best police services possible. Ready? Colors. Right shoulder. The Pittsfield Police Department is a progressive and contemporary law enforcement agency that is dedicated to protecting lives and properties and enhancing the quality of life throughout the Pittsfield community. Police departments can't police communities alone. As a result of that, we rely on partnerships with the community to provide us with information and then developing that information into intelligence. So we created uh, the Operation Copsicle uh, truck and idea in 2018. It's probably one of our greatest community assets. Where else can you just show up and have people come running to you? And yes, it's because of the ice cream, but that's what's going to start that conversation. We respond with the officers to any calls that are mental health or substance use related. If somebody is schizophrenic and not on their medication, arresting them and incarcerating them is not long-term going to yield any result but we can see that person and say, this isn't somebody who is purposefully breaking the law or intends to hurt anybody else. This is a medical issue. Every police department has to engage in difficult operations. And when we do, our community supports us. The Danville Police Department has leveraged proactive crime reduction community engagement, and technology to make their community safer and a better place to live for their citizens. Let's see how they've used their own community members to make these changes. The Danville community is a great community of about 42,000 people uh, living and working in an up-and-coming community that's, that's really trying to do better. We have really undergone a renaissance, and we're very, very proud of Danville. Truthfully, I think all of the different programs and events and projects that we do have impact on the community because it shows that we're making that effort and all of those are really just bridging that gap and having those intimate conversations with community members and our very own police officers. I'm excited to see what Chief Luke continues to offer the community. Um, I, I know a lot of people there are appreciative of his approach of neighborhood oriented policing because they're able to build those bonds and actually getting out there to know who's patrolling them, who's serving them and protecting them. I just get very excited about the future for us. I think we're gonna have a great next few years leading into the future. And I think great things are happening for our community and our department.
As a global community, the ICP is dedicated to advancing the law enforcement profession on an international scale. One key focus to global policing is providing opportunities for law enforcement professionals to expand their global network. Global Policing Director Vince Hawkes and Deputy Commissioner for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Brian Larkin, are here to discuss more. Gentlemen, welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So the I in IACP stands for international, right? So how does the IACP shape global policing? Well, we, we realize that uh, typically people look at IACP and see a domestic organization. So in the last number of years, uh, with the assistance of the Board of Directors, really try to enhance that international piece. So, so really build up that I piece. So we developed the, the global policing uh, area of IECP and enhance that by adding more resources, uh, allowing for more engagement worldwide, develop new programs uh, around the world, and really enhance that, that uh, international piece. And that's the uniqueness of this, is when you bring together the seven world chairs, we're able to talk about issues, themes, uh, policing priorities, public safety priorities, structure, legislation. And one of the things we recognize that globally, many of the issues that we're facing are a global issue. And so the, the, you know, the power of the International Association of Chiefs of Police is it brings police leaders from across the world together to innovate, to actually create think tanks that actually can change the way we provide public safety across the world. And so I think that that's where the gem and the hidden gem of the IECP really is. Well, one great example of that is, is the gender-based and domestic violence piece. Within North America, we have huge programs that we have set up and, and developed our training programs very advanced, but other parts of the world don't see it that way. So you have to build into whatever programs that we deliver on domestic violence, for example, on the issues about how that culture, the local culture is impacted by that. And, and we have developed a system within IECP to take whatever programs we have domestically and expand those worldwide. I guess my last question is, we're all here in Dallas. Uh, sun shining. So why is it important for attendees uh, here this week to get an understanding of the international role of the ICP? Well, it's an opportunity to join, you know, almost 18,000 of your colleagues uh, from a global perspective. And there's no other program, uh, public safety program, where the amount of opportunities to learn, to share, to engage the different themes, whether it's information technology, whether it's trust in policing, whether it's police reform, whether it's training or public information. There's so many different themes for police leaders to connect. We're also able to learn from each other and engage. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We really appreciate it and I hope you have a great week. So thank, thank you so very much. Our pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Public safety personnel experience PTSD and related mental health injuries much more frequently than the average civilian. Researchers with the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment are working to build evidence-based solutions to provide support for this under-recognized problem. Unlike the general public who might experience a potentially psychologically traumatic event a few times, maybe a dozen times in their life, given the environment that public safety personnel work in, they may experience hundreds if not thousands of potentially psychologically traumatic events. The research clearly shows that public safety personnel have higher rates of mental health difficulties, but they have significant problems getting access to care. The Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment is designed to support the development, dissemination and evaluation of evidence-based solutions designed specifically for public safety personnel, their families and their leaders. The first real solid research is showing that it is having an, an impact, it's having a positive effect. The fundamentally important part here is that we're talking about people. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about people who spend their time protecting us, serving us, um, and keeping our community safe. And they, they deserve the best we can come up with. Sometimes being the lone woman in a tactical training exercise can trigger a lack of confidence or unease. But imagine an environment where all of the officers are female. Meet the women of law enforcement and the successful events and mentorship its leaders offer each year. It's well known that their women only represent somewhere between 12 and 13 percent of law enforcement officers across the country. In some places it's even smaller than that. We have a long way to go.
My name is Carrie White. I am the chief of the Forney Police Department. I'm also the president of the Women of Law Enforcement organization. The Women of Law Enforcement is an organization that really started from a vision um, to supply and bring training to women. Women tend to be the minority in a class or the only female in a class. And sometimes that's, that can be a little intimidating. I and mean, sometimes you can get into your own head a little bit. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here is trying to provide them that environment where they can learn free of judgment and be uh, comfortable in their surroundings and confident in their abilities. The energy of these women is incredible. What we're doing is working. Uh, it's proven to be effective. We're seeing sparks in them and they're wanting to become uh, more engaged and more involved at their agencies. They're wanting to take on leadership roles and we just need help spreading that. It's been exactly one year since the launch of the Mass Violence Advisory Initiative. Here now with more on the creation of the initiative and how it's going, Orange County Sheriff John Mina and retired Aurora Chief Kristen Zimmern. Tell us a little bit about the uh, ICP Mass Violence uh, Initiative. So the Mass Violence uh, Advisory Initiative was created basically to help communities and law enforcement agencies navigate um, should they have a tragedy of a mass shooting in their community. And it's a, a group of subject matter experts that can provide guidance and direction um, to help uh, law enforcement leaders and other community members through this process. I mean, you both um, had to deal with incidents like uh, this. What were some of the challenges that you faced that perhaps you weren't expecting? What you don't prepare for is the raw, unadulterated emotion that comes not only from the community, but from the officers and, and of course the victims and um, families. And so that becomes uh, very challenging to manage and you, and you have to get it right. How do you manage that? For us, it was having, uh, having professionals set up, come in and, and let the officers talk to them. And I will tell you when I realized we were going to be okay was when the first officer broke down and just sob. And I knew in that moment that we were going to be okay because that happened in front of his comrades. It's a constant communication and making sure that we're talking through it. But what I realized is this is an ongoing thing. You can't just be right after the incident. It's got to be six months down the road on the one year anniversary. And, you know, even up to five years down the road, uh, officers are still dealing with some of the things they saw. What advice would you give to, uh, to, to law enforcement agencies about what they could do now to, to, to prepare for events like this? You need to know what your capabilities are, what you can do, what you can't do. And then if another agency is going to come help you with that operation, you need to train with them. And if, from the leadership perspective, table talk exercises and, and collaboration are, are huge on the front end. Put them through high stress training because we have found that that you play like you practice and you do not rise to the level of the expectations you fall to the level of training and so that is imperative thank you both ever so much indeed for joining us a really fascinating discussion so thank you thank you thank you to an institute working to make mental health a priority the meadows mental health policy institute is advocating for and developing the nation's first statewide peer network designed to end law enforcement suicide Let's see how they're working toward a goal of zero suicides right here in Texas. Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute has been around since the end of 2013. They realized that many of the issues that are impeding progress in mental health are because of systemic factors that need to be addressed at the policy level. So we really focused on helping people with mental health get the same quality of health care as people who have other health care needs. We work with health care systems, justice systems, uh, stakeholders, legislators, policymakers, and communities across the country to look at how all communities can ensure that all persons who have health care and mental health care needs can receive those care needs. We really want all people across our country to have the same expectation of quality when they have a mental health concern as they have when they have cancer, when they have heart disease. So police departments are leading the way for a revolution that is going to help every American. The Justice Collaboratory is a membership-based social science research center at Yale Law School. The JC's work is centered around the criminal justice system, 
with the goal of creating an evidence-informed justice system. The Justice Collaboratory was founded in 2015 by professors Tracy Mears and Tom Tyler. Their goal was to bring together a group of nationally recognized academics, researchers, and social scientists who all shared the same goal, which was to build a more just, effective, and democratic criminal legal system. What is exciting about this moment in policing is it's the culmination of 20 years of research by criminologists, psychologists, and other social scientists into different strategies of policing that might help the police achieve their goal. My hope for the future of policing is that agencies start to take science seriously and build their goals and policies around what the science says regarding promoting trust and legitimacy. Our role is to provide the science and the theories that will help agencies achieve this vision. That does it for day one of the IACP annual conference and exhibition. There's still much more to come. We need to do uh, everything we can to not only serve our communities, but serve our police officers and try to protect them to the extent that uh, is possible. Tomorrow we sit down with the new incoming IACP president about what plans he has for the future. Plus, we'll continue our tour across the country, highlighting departments at the forefront of law enforcement. Plus, we'll check in with you, hear from fellow attendees about what makes ICP so special and what it's like to finally be being back meeting in person. As you head out today, remember, you can always find the latest ICP TV episode right here on the TVs displayed throughout the Convention Center. On the homepage of the ICP meeting website, back in your hotel rooms on the in-house ICP TV channel. Check us out on your shuttle bus ride to and from the Convention Center. And as always, you can find us on our YouTube channel or Twitter feed. We'll see you right back here tomorrow for more ICP TV. Have a great one.